Hi, folks. Welcome back. It's great to have you here. Rush Limbaugh, the EIB Network, the Limbaugh Institute for Advanced Conservative Studies. I am America's real anchorman, America's truth detector, and doctor of democracy. All in one harmless, lovable, little fuzzball bundle. 800-282-2882 and the email address lrushbo at eibnet.com. Here's another thing about the State of the Union thing. I'm going to move on here in just a second. But I didn't watch it last night. If, uh, if you didn't hear the first hour, and I'm this is the first you're hearing of it, I just couldn't bring myself to do it. I knew what was going to happen. I knew the attitude. I know I was going to end up being insulted as, as a conservative. I was going to be lied to. And I just didn't feel like coming in here and giving you uh, the equivalent of an oral final exam, meaning verbal report on it. You know, can I tell you what's telling about this? Remember the build up to this thing yesterday and the day before and last week? The drive bys have been breathlessly anticipating last night's State of the Union address for days. And they have been trying to get everybody hyped up for it. Oh, it's going to be so revelatory. It's going to be so important, so meaningful. Obama is going to announce the next Santa Claus list and blah, 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 blah. It was hailed, promoted as one of the most important states of the union ever. It was going to be comprehensive. All of this hype, all of this focus on it. You know what the most telling thing about Obama's speech is? Is that after today, we will not hear another word about it ever. Even though yesterday and the day before and in a weekend in the Sunday shows and even into last Friday, even with all of that, it was the, it was the lead topic about 75% of the news sites, New York Times, Washington Post, Politico, that's all there was, the State of the Union. That's all it was. There was nothing else going on. There was a countdown clock on CNN, probably. We had pre-analysis. We had post-analysis. We had post-post-analysis. We had post-analysis post. We just devoted everything to it. And in a couple of hours, not another word will ever be said about it which to me is the classic example of Barnum and Bailey con man hype and ratcheting up people's emotions to a fevered pitch. Speaking of that, somebody, an Academy voter, has written a piece in the Hollywood Reporter magazine explaining why Selma didn't get any nominations. And there are two reasons. And the first one was what uh, I and many others considered to be relevant, and that is they just didn't get enough screeners out. They didn't get enough DVDs to the Academy to see the damn thing. Most of the Academy voters, it's beneath them to go to a theater because the hoi polloi is in there. So they watch these nominated movies on DVDs that are produced by the studios, and they're sent around. And apparently there were not very many for Selma. But the second reason is, the guy actually says, I can't remember his name right now, I'll get it in a minute, never heard of him, doesn't matter, but he claims to have been an Academy voter in good standing. He says, we get race fatigue out here. That's what he, racial fatigue. If it's not 12 years a slave, it's Django Unchained. If it isn't Django Unchained, it's uh, driving Miss Daisy. If it isn't this, and he admits this. He says, look, at we've only, these are my words, not his, but what he means is our emotional reservoirs are only so deep. There's only so much caring about this anybody has. And after a while, you're out. Well, that's me on the State of the Union. There's only so much you can care about. There's only so much passion, care, concern you can invest in it. And I've given the State of the Union everything I've got. And my tank was empty last night. Well, well, it yeah, it used to be fun political theater. It to me, I remember one time uh, within the first four years of the program. You know when it was all new, 
And the drive-bys didn't know what to make of me. They'd never heard of me. They didn't know who I was. But it was big, and they didn't understand it. And to them, I didn't come from any of the acceptable places. I didn't have an Ivy League education. Uh, I didn't know anybody that they knew inside the Beltway. I mean, I just popped up out of nowhere, and as such was a huge curiosity item. And in those days, this would be the Clinton years, the Washington Post, I think two or three years in a row, sent a reporter to the studio to report for three hours my take on the Clinton State of the Union for like two, I think maybe three years in a row. Some of them wouldn't send camera crews in because it was all so new to them. And after one of these um, uh, events, after a State of the Union, after my show, after a State of the Union, the Washington Post info babe, it was a reporterette, and she wanted to interview me after the show, to which I said, what more do you need to hear? I just did three hours on this. Well, I need to ask you some questions. Okay. And she said, boy, do you just act like this is the most fun in the world? You just... I said, no, you're misinterpreting. This is the hardest work in the world. What do you mean? I said, this is like an oral final exam here. I got a president making a speech chock full of BS last night. I got an audience expecting me in less than 10 hours to break it all down and tell them the total truth about it. I got you here watching writing about it. This is high pressure, ma'am. This is big time pressure. Did you ever have to do an oral final exam in journalism school? Uh, no. Well, I have to do one every day here. And my audience is the class. And I'm not the professor. They are. They're the ones that hand out the grades. And I'm the one that has to get the good ones or I'm out. Well, you mean it's work? Yes, it's, it's hard work. I got a president can't tell the truth. I got you facilitating his lies, you and all his buddies, your buddies. And I've got to sit here, and my audience has these high expectations. I'm going to tell them the truth about this. So, yeah, it was fun in that sense. It was fun at political theater. Uh, but there was also a time where the substance of the damn thing mattered. It wasn't that long ago that when a president showed up to a State of the Union, he actually spent some time on the State of the Union. Not just an opening sentence, I am here to report to you tonight that the State of our Union is firm and strong, except for the balls in New England. And then they would move on into their wish list. There used to be a time when we'd actually get a report on the State of the Union. But when these speeches began to be, well, you might even be able to trace this back to Nixon. But if not Nixon, would it have been? They became Christmas lists. They became, the speech became just a series of empty promises. And as such, the substance vanished. And it didn't even matter whether any of it was ever going to happen, whether Congress, and most of it never happened because Congress really doesn't take up all that much. Well, well, uh, well, I don't know. You know, Nixon had his, his laundry. Reagan's State of the Union addresses were... Reagan's State of the Union, he would call the, uh, the freedom fighters in Nicaragua the uh, moral equivalent of our founding fathers, and that ticked off the media. And he would, re he would talk about defeating the Soviet Union. It was serious stuff. Reagan didn't do gift lists of what he was going to give everybody, food stamp increases, free community college. Uh, oh, yeah, when he announced uh, Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI, Star Wars. Oh, they had a cow. The point is there are days in the past where the State of the Union was actually a substantive thing and something that you could learn from. This, this was just political theater, complete with a fraudulent hard luck story. This, this, I, I don't think we can spend enough time on this. But I did in the first hour, so I'm not going to go through it here again. But just a, a fraudulent hard luck story. A former Democrat staffer sitting in hallowed ground next to Michelle Obama. Total fake. And if her story was real, I, I want to reiterate, if her hard luck story is real, if she did have to come up from nothing and was eating and swallowing dirt every day, let's not forget who she was working for. She said, working for Patty Murray. She said, Democrat campaign staffer. They must not pay their people very much. And their benefit package must be pretty bad if the woman was suffering like that to qualify as a hard luck success story.
because of Obama's reach out to the middle class. 